Saidaru ite mana o nga tangata mai kunai mana finwa nga kichora nga chira me te atia wa taranaki kite upoko tika e he mihi mai o ha he mihi mahana he mihi aroha te nei ki o kātou kato ki a koe e te ranga chira. Tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe, koutou o ngā whānau kua tai mai ki te tautoko i a koe. Ki a koe e te rangatira o tēnei wānanga, ki a koe hoki me ngā whananga, ngā mihi tēnei ki a koutou, a ki a tātou kato ki o ngā. Mai i a atu te pua, mai i a atu te uto, e tino me i ki a koutou, koutou. Mai te whare wānau o Otaka, kautau rauranga tira mai rungi te pai pai tapu i tino mei, i tēnei rangi, ka uru mai e te i atu, i roto, i te rōpū tākuta, i te rōpū ranga tira, i te rōpū tūmuaki, e arataki ai, te mātauranga o tō kautau whare wānanga, o reira nau mai, ara mai, piki mai, kaki mai, ki a kautau, Kua tae ki te pakarongo atu ki tēnei kōru o tua tae, nau mai, whakatau mai. As my cousin mentioned, it's a very, very um, warm welcome to you all. It's very special, that first inaugural speech, and I'm so thankful that um, I am um, fortunate enough to be here to um, listen to it. So welcome, welcome, thrice welcome, no, my ara, my piki, my kake, my whakatau, my tēnā koutou, kia ora mai tātou, katoa. Kia ora. at the University of Otago and the University of Otago Wellington sits uh, in our division of health sciences and that's why I'm here. I'm also here representing the Vice-Chancellor who unfortunately couldn't be here today and she sends her apologies. These are very, very special events. To celebrate a new professor at the University of Otago is a very special event. And it, I'm, I'd like to welcome you all to the event and also to the lecture, and also everybody on Zoom, our virtual attendees, of which there are many this evening. To become a professor at the University of Otago is exceptionally difficult. We don't make it very easy for people, I have to say. <laughs> and the standard you have to achieve is extraordinarily high. Now, I chair the promotions committee for the division, and we have had record numbers of promotion applications in recent years. But I can reflect back to you, and more importantly to Anna, actually, that when her application was reviewed by the panel in the division, it was unanimously supported without any need for further discussion. So clearly we have a colleague of the highest calibre who is very worthy of the promotion to professor. And we celebrate that tonight, where a new professor introduces herself or himself as a professor to their community. And I hope that you all have a very, very enjoyable evening. Now, sadly, because of recent events as of today, the Vice-Chancellor has called a urgent meeting of the senior leadership team to think about the Prime Minister's announcement with, reflect, with respect to COVID. So, unfortunately, I'm going to dash away, and I'm not going to unfortunately be here, which 
as you know, I was particularly wanted to be at this IPL. So I look at the recording later. I promise I will do that. Um, so please enjoy your evening, and I'm sorry I'm going to have to dash away. And at this point, I'll introduce Professor William Levac, Dean of the University of Otago, Wellington, to introduce Anna to you more formally. And please enjoy your evening, and thank you very much for your attention. Tinakoto, kamehiho ki te kaikaranga, Dr. Kiri Lawson Tiaho. Kamehiho, Peter Jackson, thank you very much for your fai kora korero and your um, opening words. Uh, ko wai o, uh, ko nati pākiha te iwi, uh, nō uh, kotarana me ingarangi uh, uku tipuna, uh, ko Appen Stewart me Levac nā whānau nō uh, kotarana, uh, ko William Levac toko ingoa, ko o te manutaki ki te whare wānanga o tāgo ki ponake. Uh, ihara, uh, ihara o hau, I te uh, tangata mōhio uh, ki te kōrero, uh, o tira uh, i tika ana mō, mō uh, kia, kia mihi atu, kia mihi mai. Uh, nō reira, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora tātou katoa. Welcome everybody to, uh, not quite the University of Otago, Wellington, we are next door. <laughs> Um, and thank you very much for uh, um, finding your way here since we changed the venue. Uh, it, it's, um, it's been a very busy couple of weeks. It's a good week to have good uh, friends and colleagues uh, working alongside us to, um, to achieve things. And I'm delighted in this context to take a moment to sit down and listen. <laughs> but I'm also delighted, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Anna Ranta to you tonight. Um, to me, Anna is a long-time colleague, advisor, and most excellent friend. Uh, Anna is also an academic, a neurologist, uh, an international expert in the management of stroke, a head of department um, in the Department of Medicine at the University of Otago. Anna is the president of the Neurological Association of New Zealand, the treasurer of uh, the Stroke Society of Australasia, a member of the World Stroke Organisational Board and Global Policy Committee, uh, and she serves on many editorial boards of stroke and uh, many editorial boards such as for stroke and neurology to internationally reputed journals. Uh, Anna's, focus, Anna's research focuses on improving stroke and neurological care uh, for New Zealanders and globally. Uh, she's the primary investigator on a number of significant research programs, including clinical trials on telehealth artificial intelligence, and service integration. Her research has involved epidemiological and mixed methods. Um, it's involved health registries and big data. Uh, it's involved uh, health economic analyses and co-design to address health inequities for stroke and beyond. Uh, Anna ticks all the boxes for scholarly excellence. But more importantly than that, Anna's research has had impact, it's had direct impact on the lives and the, and the health and well-being of New Zealanders. As I'm sure we'll hear more about tonight, her work has directly impacted on the quality of medical care for people after stroke, changing the way we deliver stroke service care throughout the country, um, and, and quite simply saving lives. So Anna is a, is, a, is a colleague who it's easy to be proud of. Anna was raised and, um, and uh, born and raised in Germany. She completed a neurology and fellowship training in the University of uh, Virginia in USA um, before coming with her family uh, 15 years ago to New Zealand, Aotearoa. She lived for eight years in Palmerston North where she um, led and implemented the first of University of Otago's uh, full year placements for medical students in, um, in uh, central, mid-central DHB. Uh, in her role as Associate Dean of Med Undergraduate Medical Education Regional. Um, since uh, 2014, she moved to Wellington to take up the role of Executive Clinical Director of Medicine, Cancer um, and Community Director for Capital Coast District Health Board, where she's had ongoing significant impact. In 2018, she transitioned to the Head of Department um, uh, for the University of Otago, uh, Wellington, where she became my boss. Um, since coming to New Zealand, she's led no, uh, numerous local, regional and national stroke initiatives, um, uh, including the implementation of New Zealand's first regional tele-stroke um, tele network. And I'm not, I'm not going to tell you more about that because I'm sure we're going to hear about it tonight. And also the development of a, an important national stroke registry. 
So um, please join with me in welcoming to the podium Professor Anna Ranta. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. He waka e kanoa, tīhe Māori ora. E te whāra o te iwi, tēnā koe. E te whenua tapu o te mārea, tēnā koe. E rea re haere ana ngā mihi ki ngāti toa ki atsi awa, te mana whenua o tēne rohe. E ngā mate, e o ki haere atu rā. Koutou kua hui hui mai, ngā kanohi ora ora tu tēnā hoki koutou. Nō tia mana to, o ko tūpuna, nō tia mana a hau. Ko Dolomitsi te manga, ko Elbe te awa, ko Lufthansa te waka. Ko ana renta toko ingoa. Kei te whāre wānanga o Otago Poniki a hau e mahi ana. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kā tewa. So, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted that there's more than five people here. Uh, I was, uh, you know, with the closure of the school last week and actually two days ago and then the COVID scare today. So we'll, we'll see where we go. So thank you so much for making the effort of coming here today. So today I'll be talking about whether different folks have different strokes and tell you about the unexpected journey that brought me to ever even ponder this question. Actually, I'll be taking you um, on three different unexpected journeys, a geographic one, a professional one, and a personal one, all interwoven throughout this talk. I'll start a bit about my background, where I come from. Most of my talk, however, will focus on my research, and then I'll finish up with some reflections. So as a baby, I spent the first couple years of my life in Anaba, Algeria, in North Africa, which is where my parents did medical aid. We then traveled back to Hamburg, where I spent the next 16 years. That's where my family is from. And here are some pictures of my childhood heroes. First, of course, is my mother, who taught me kindness and the importance of being conscientious of other people's feelings. Below my mother is my brother, my older brother, who taught me just about everything, but most importantly, he taught me the feeling of having a good man behind you who's always there to catch you when you fall. On the right side is my father, and he taught me that, that to always believe in the good in people, and that you can do anything you want if you put your right mind to it, and if you are persistent, if you're tenacious, and if you're resilient. And in the top middle is my maternal grandfather. He was a resistance fighter during the Second World War in Nazi Germany. He spent much of his time in concentration camps. And he taught me the importance of integrity and then to, and the importance of finding the courage to do what's right. When I was 16, we moved it's quite small up there. Uh, we moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where they make burger Wisconsin, not really. Um, so uh, that's where we moved when, we were, when I was 16, and that was really exciting, except it had some downsides, because suddenly my dream of becoming a writer or an actress really seemed silly, considering I hardly spoke English. So I figured I might as maybe get to be fluent in English someday, um, but I certainly will never lose my German accent. So I, I decided that wasn't a good idea. And I headed off to uh, St. Mary's College in Maryland. And at that time, I still wasn't quite sure what I'd be wanting to do. And I majored in biology and philosophy. At the, end of my at the end of my college career, I was thinking that I'd probably want to do, uh, become a professor of uh, philosophy. So I wanted to go to graduate school. But um, that didn't quite uh, turn out the way I planned. And mm. Um, but before I move on to the next step, I wanted to show you my yearbook picture. So if you, can you guess who I am? So I'm that middle top person. I was always a little bit different. And I just wanted to put that up because I, I, the quote, I was looking at these pictures, you know, you put this talk together, and I looked at my quote that I had in my book, and the quote was, um, no one can construct for you the bridge upon which precisely you must cross the stream of life, no one but yourself alone. 
And little did I know how much truth there was in that, uh, in the life that lay ahead. Now that was a quote from Friedrich Nietzsche, who I wrote my sen senior thesis about. And Nietzsche is a really difficult character. I love Nietzsche, his wonderful ideas, but he was an absolute misogynist. And that was my thesis topic. But I reconciled that and decided, you know what, I'm not gonna throw out the baby with the bathwater. And the man's done some really great work and I cherish that and I'm just going to accept the rest. A similar battle I had with Martin Heidegger, who is an existentialist and I also absolutely adore, but he was a member of the Nazi party. And that really upset me and I had to really grapple with that. But in the end, I decided that I can take the good and forgive the bad or at least accept the bad and still cherish what I can get out of the other, other aspects. And I think that's something a little bit relevant in today's culture. Anyway, so after your railing twice, taking a crazy bike trip across Eastern Europe and Turkey, and becoming a very fine car mechanic, I ended up going to medical school at Penn State University. Now, at Penn State, I entered wanting to be an academic surgeon. That's what I wanted to be. And I liked the brain. I'd studied philosophy, and I thought neurosurgery would be a really cool job. And I inquired. So I called up the, the university I wanted to train at, and I asked, what about positions? And they said, actually, we don't take women. I was like, huh, OK. So I talked around, and pretty much everyone told me, you know, surgery really isn't a woman thing, certainly not kind of a normal woman thing. And I was like, what does that mean? It's like, well, you want to have kids, you want know, to have a family, um, you know, you, you, that's not going to work for you. And I was like, okay. So I said, well, I guess I'll be a physician. And I, don't get me wrong, I love being a physician, but it was not where I started. And so I decided to become a neurologist. And I interviewed for neurology programs, and I interviewed at my school which was my head of department. I had no intentions of going there. I just did this to be courteous to the school. And he said to me, well, Anna, we know you're great. You're absolutely competent, super smart, but why would I give you a job when I could give the job to a man who's not going to get pregnant and I'm going to have to find cover? So that was my indoctrination to medicine. Fortunately, not everyone felt that way. And I ended up um, going to Virginia for my uh, neurology training after going to NYU in Manhattan to do my medicine. I can tell you the skiing in Virginia is terrible. I just put a skiing picture in it because I really like skiing. But the best part about Virginia is I got married to John. So John is my husband. He's up here. Um, we, we met and we got married and that's been the absolute best part of my life really. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. And then shortly after that, Sierra arrived. So that little munchkin there is Sierra and she's really tall now, taller than me and you'll hear more from her about, about her later as well. So um, that, was, that was Virginia. A little bit more about Virginia. So Virginia really had a major impact on me and Charlottesville is not all bad. It's a little bit bad, but it's not all bad. And there's some really wonderful people in Virginia, and these are some of them. And when I had Sierra, which was the two days before the end of my residency, which I thought was great because I wasn't impacting my team at all, but I had no job, and now I was going to have this baby. So I needed a fellowship job because I still had this idea, maybe I'd do academics. So um, what happened is I asked around if anyone wanted to fire me being pregnant because I had disclosed this. I had felt I had to disclose this. And I was interested in epilepsy stroke and neuro ICU and epilepsy jumped quickest. And they offered me a job with two weeks, uh, two months off at the beginning of the fellowship. And that was such a great offer that I said, wait, I'll be an epileptologist. So that's what I did. But I still absolutely cherish all the other people who are in the pictures here, who are my mentors and still have been my mentors and a special recognition of Myla Goldman, who is, was my best friend in residency and a great friend today. So before I move away from Virginia, I just need to tell you one little anecdote, which is um, involving this place, which is in Staunton, uh, Virginia, which is the state hospital for psychiatric patients. So when you do a neurology training in America, you have to do psychiatry. We're double boarded in psychiatry. And at this hospital, the psychiatrist said, you know what, you like traveling. If you ever have an opportunity, you must absolutely go to New Zealand. And I was like, New Zealand? I didn't really know much about New Zealand. I thought there was like sheep there. I honestly <coughs> never heard about the All Blacks. I'm sorry. Um, and I thought it was near Australia somewhere. And uh, he's like, yeah, they because. I was like, why? It's like, oh, because every hospital is by the beach and they work from 10 to 3. <laughs> I was like, like, oh, well, that sounds pretty good. And then another thing, so I sort of tucked that away. And then a couple years later, a movie came out. And I watched this movie. 
and it was like landscapes like that. And I was like, oh my God, what did they film this? This is all CG. They didn't really have CG back then. And so I looked it up and I was like, oh my God, they filmed this in New Zealand. This is some kind of thing. I got to look into this New Zealand thing. But of course, it was completely unattainable. It seemed completely a ridiculous thing to do. So um, uh, what I did carry on in life. So we were in Virginia. We then moved to Atlanta where John did his master's in philosophy and I worked part-time in private practice. Academia off the table. I now had a young family and I had to support my husband and my child. And uh, that's my story in Atlanta where I was for two years in private practice. Except then I got pregnant with baby number two, Daphne, who's also here. And I told my practice about this and they said, oh, that, um, that's really bad. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, well, I thought it was kind of good. Um, yeah, uh, what about maternity leave? Oh, well, you do have two weeks of annual leave. And um, no, it's, it's great. You, you, you keep your rooms. That's no problem. All you have to do is pay $14,000 US a month to cover the overheads. And I was like, what kind of deal is that? So I'm going to pay you for my maternity leave. So I said, well, that's stupid. And I quit. Uh, until well, I worked two weeks till I delivered to make lots of money as much as I could because I was going to be unemployed. So that was my maternity plan number two. And um, we had to move to Florida because we were kicked out of our apartment because it was this new school year and we didn't want to stay in Atlanta um, because John decided he was not going to get his full, fully funded scholarship um, PhD program in Marquette and instead take care of the babies and be a home dad. Um, and so uh, we said, well, where are we going to go? Like, we're not going to stay in Atlanta. We're not going to go. But I don't want to live in Florida for good. No, no, sorry, my parents are listening. Um, you know, I, I don't really want to live. We didn't want to live in rural Maryland where his family was from. And he's like, well, it's obvious. And I was like, what do you mean? It's like, well, you keep saying, come home from work. Say, oh, this was a crappy day. That's it, we're moving to New Zealand. It's like, this is our chance. We gotta move to New Zealand. I was like, I was kind of kidding about that. So <laughs> next thing I know, we've decided to go to New Zealand. We told our landlady, she said, nope, you cannot renew for another month. So we left a week, a month before delivery. John left down. I followed them two weeks later and we delivered in Sarasota. And so these were our 12, wild 12 months. There's Daphne and there's the Daddy John. And so we were in, in this hospital. I was out of state two days after my finished contract in, in um, Atlanta. And I had checked three times with Blue Cross Blue Shield about insurance. And we were in the hospital, delivered. We did it real cheap. My, husband, my, my brother did the epidural. My sister-in-law did the baby check. I was out within 24 hours of the delivery, you know, keeping it cost-free. We're at home. A day later, I get a call from the hospital. How would you like to pay for the $12,000 charge? Uh, credit card or bank transfer? And I said, wait a minute, I have insurance. Oh, honey, they all say that. But if you pay right now, if you give me my credit card, I'll give you a 10% discount. But that offer is only today. And I'm like breaking down in tears, postpartum depression. So long story, continues on for months. I won't tell you that, but I was pretty glad to leave America. Um, before we left America, we visited family in America, said goodbye to our family in, in, um, in the States, and then packed everything we could into every kind of piece of luggage we could. And there we are going off to New Zealand for one year. That was in 2007, and we followed the pole of the rain. <laughs> So, New, New Zealand beginnings, 2007 to 2014, Palmerston North, wonderful team in Palmerston North, um, and that's where I became, so this is an epileptologist, I'm an epileptologist at this point who kind of did private practice, now I'm in Palmerston North, and now they need a stroke service. I'm like, okay, well, I'm a neurologist, I could do stroke, um, I like stroke. So I became the stroke lead in Palmerston North. I also became the medical head because I was the only neurologist in Palmerston North. And um, so that's sort of where my stroke journey began. Also began my academic career, which I'd given up on completely uh, because I thought I was going to be a, a woman who was having children, and that was my priority. And Peter Crampton entered my life and offered me a position as associate dean, and he's been really instrumental in encouraging me along the way. All right, so that's my background. Now I'll talk to you about my research. Before I do that, everyone here needs to understand what a stroke is. And most of you do know what a stroke is, but some of you may not. So simply put, stroke is the loss of brain function due to disruption of blood supply to the brain. And there are two kinds of strokes. There's an ischemic stroke where you have a blocked blood vessel. 
So you see here there's a blood vessel and there's a blockage and then you have what's called ischemia behind that because there's no more oxygen reaching that brain and it slowly dies. If it's not re-established within a specific time frame, the, the brain, the damage is irreversible. Then there is a hemorrhagic stroke, which is a burst blood vessel, um, can cause very, very similar symptoms, but it is a slightly different mechanism of action. Transient ischemic attack is a mini stroke, which is transient ischemia. So it's this situation, but it spontaneously reperfuses. So the blood clot breaks up, blood flow is reestablished, oxygen reaches the brain, and everything is fine, and symptoms resolve within a few hours. It's a really important um, sign of stroke recurrence though, so we want to intervene very quickly to avoid that patient coming back with a big stroke. So it's a great opportunity for prevention. Why is stroke important? It's a worldwide health problem, second most common cause of death and disability globally. More than one billion a year are spent on, on this New Zealand health spending and stroke burden, the stroke burden is increasing. A few years ago, the Ministry of Health commissioned me to do modeling about stroke volumes in New Zealand. And uh, based on that data and that modeling, we are expecting a 40% increase by 2028. And this is not based on increasing incidence. Incidence is slowly uh, going down, but not fast enough to keep up with population growth and aging. So my first research project, and um, so this started off as a service improvement project and then turned into a research project, was the TIA Stroke Electronic Decision Support Tool for GPs. So in Palmerston North Hospital, we got a lot of patients referred with these mini strokes and half of them didn't have a mini stroke. Um, many of them didn't present to us in the right time frame, so they referred too late. Some of them presented to clinic when they should have gone to ED straight away, and some of them didn't have the right treatment in place before they reached us. Um, so I wanted to address that, and I worked with BPAC, who some of you will know, and based in Dunedin with Murray Tilliard, and we developed this decision support tool. And this looks a little bit like Health Pathways, but this is actually before Health Pathways came, became really a big thing. So we developed this, and there's some logic tree behind it. So it's sort of the pocket neurologist. For the, for the GP to not call me all the time or send patients, but do the work on, them, on their own in their practice and to help with triaging. So this is something we do more commonly um, in other areas now, but it was pretty novel at the time. And then it rendered advice to the GP. Um, and I want to just acknowledge Mike Grant, who was the planning and funding um, manager over at, uh, at Mid-Central, and he was super supportive of this, and he's been a really supportive person for me throughout my career. So people thought this was great. I got some kind of award for this, and like, let's use it. And I was like, well, I don't know. Like, it could cause harm. I don't know if it's going to really work very well. I want to do research. I want to actually study this. And I, by that time, I'd gotten a postgrad diploma or a certificate and statistics and epidemiology, so I knew a little bit of something, but I decided, oh, I, I need to do an RCT. So everybody thought that was kind of crazy, some lady in Palmerston North doing an RCT. How am I going to get funding? Oh, I'm going to apply to this thing called HRC that I never heard of before. They seem to give money out. And so I applied, and uh, against all odds, I amazingly got this grant to do the study. And we did the study in 56 GP practices and we enrolled around 250 patients. It was a great time because I met all these GPs and I loved meeting GPs and I always say I visited them in their natural habitat. So, um, and the outcomes from the study showed that th these were practices that were randomized to having access to the tool or not having access to the tool. They didn't even have to use the tool. Of course, most of them did use the tool, but it was just whether they had access. Practices that had access had a 72% guideline adherence uh, practices that didn't had a 41% guideline adherence. More importantly, pr intervention practices had a 90-day vascular risk outcome of 3.5% versus the control practices who had 12% um, events at 90 days. So this was a highly significant result and resulted in the Ministry of Health agreeing to fund rollout nationally. So that was very exciting. The work continues. We're now working, we've just finished the development of an atrial fibrillation decision support tool with BPAC, and I'm working with Professor Stewart, uh, Brave Stewart and cardiologist in Auckland and doing a slightly more cross-disciplinary approach. And this is now, we're now recruiting GP practices. So if you're a GP or no one who might be interested, let me know. But after that, I was pretty sick of TIA. I wanted to do something different, and I totally shifted to reperfusion therapies. So reperfusion therapies in stroke is, you know, when you have that blockage that I showed you, is a way to unblock that blockage. And you can do that either through um, a medication or a treatment. 
and it's the only way to really reverse stroke symptoms um, when, once they've occurred. And uh, you know, everything after that is a, a passive recovery. So there's Ultaplace, which is the medication. More recently, we've used Tenecteplase. And then there's stroke clot retrieval. So stroke clot retrieval is a procedure where you have a wire that goes into the groin, it goes up to the brain, and you physically pull up the clot and pull out the clot. And that's something that's done by interventional neuroradiologists. The problem with these treatments is that they are very time sensitive and they're quite complicated, requiring special expertise. So access is a real issue. Uh, thrombolysis has to be given within four and a half hours of symptom onset and clot retrieval done within six to seven hours of symptom onset, or else the damage is irreversible. Now, in 2008, there was a national audit, and the thrombolysis rate at that time was 3% nationally. So that's quite low. Um, and so we started a lot of initiatives, and they're not necessarily in chronological order, but I'll just run through a few. I, I contributed to the national FAST campaign that some of you will hopefully have seen. So I was the medical advisor for that for a time, and I did the evaluation around it, which demonstrated to the Ministry of Health, yes, it is working, and, but we could refine it a little bit to do uh, you know, continuous campaigning rather than, than sort of these, these three-month episodes and uh, we cont have continued funding to running the FAST campaign. So that, that made a difference. We also ran a thrombolysis working group through the National Stroke Network that I chaired, and we did uh, uh, aligning guidelines. But I think the other really big thing that made a difference is the National Stroke Register, which um, I think William mentioned, or the National Thrombolysis Register. And here are some people who've contributed this over, over the years. Again, we've had minimal funding from the Ministry of Health. I think we had about $50,000 to get this off, get this started. In Australia, I think they had uh, several million. I think the cardiac register had a million or two. So we did this on a shoestring. But we pulled it together on REDCap, which I established at CCDHB that other clinicians can use now and we have found a steady rise. And what the med register does, it, it provides metrics and people can compare to one another and exchange ideas, you know, identify the real stellar places and then talk to each other and what can be done better. So I'm really proud of the fact that nationally the thermolysis rate has steadily increased to around 10, 12%. And we've published this in a number of articles. But I was still concerned about the fact that it wasn't just low thrombolysis rate, there was inequity in thrombolysis. So these are the 20 DHBs, and I've put arrows to all the hospitals that are in our regions here in the central region of New Zealand. And so this is a hospital near you, one of these, and these are doing good, but these four really aren't. And this was in 2015, so we weren't doing enough. We were raising it, but it was rising like this, and we needed equity. Um, geographic equity, which we weren't achieving. So uh, telestroke seemed the obvious solution. Now telestroke is where you have video conferencing into an ED and you have a specialist at the other end and it removes the problem that out of hours, uh, these smaller hospitals don't have specialists. They all have specialists during the daytime, one or two, but they cannot keep a specialist roster going at night. So you have generalists managing, and nothing wrong with generalists, but they might see one patient a year. So it's very hard to build up that knowledge um, base and maintain skill with that. So that's what we, but, but nobody wanted to do it. So this was in 2011, 12. Um, I, I was in Palmerston North, really hard to get people excited. But one person was excited about it, which was Martin Whitehead in Scotland. <laughs> now you wonder like how that's going to work. They had a telestroke network and he called me up and he said, what do you think about using the time zones? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you're asleep when I'm awake and I'm awake when you're asleep. So uh, if I thrombolize somebody during my daytime as in New Zealand, then then I'll be awake when they're there at night. I was like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. So everyone thought that was completely crazy. Uh, everyone, nobody, I actually say all my colleagues um, thought it was completely crazy. I mean, I'm talking about the international stroke community, not, not here. And, uh, but we thought, well, this sounds too good to be true. And all the managers really liked it. Patients thought it made complete sense. I mean, if you think about it, it makes sense. So we tried this and we actually got it off the ground. We went through a lot of medical legal hoops. Medical council changed their regulations. I was ready to change the New Zealand law to make this happen. And it was pretty crazy. Um, and then it stopped because the clinicians in Scotland felt too far away from the clinicians in New Zealand. It was a clinician problem. So, and I point that out because we often blame managers for problems, but sometimes we're our own worst enemies. If 
But for various reasons, I moved to Wellington, and moving to Wellington changed everything because now I was part of a team that was excited about the idea of doing telestroke, and we provided it to the region. We did a pilot uh, of six months to regional hospitals in the area, funded by the Ministry of Health, again with pretty modest funding, but they got us some video conferencing units, and what you can see here is pre-telestroke, um, pretty low rates in these three regional hospitals. With telestroke, it went up. And this is six months post telestroke, meaning we're still doing it, um, but we're continuing to see rise. And this is just out of hours. So this was pretty exciting. And then you look at this, well, what's happened to Nelson Hospital? What happened there? Well, Nelson Hospital decided, well, we're all upskilled now. Thank you very much. We're going to do our own thrombolysis again. We'll call you if we need you. Um, and they went right back down to their original rate. So after six months later, they decided, OK, well, maybe, maybe you should you should do our telestroke. Um, so we pursued to that, and we've had a few publications about that. And looking at national data, all the regional hospitals in New Zealand who have telestroke support and those who don't, a clear differential in thrombolysis rate, 12.6% for those who have telestroke, 72 for those that don't. We have a shorter door to needle time, which is important because time is brain and we have a lower complication rate. So it really does work and has really made a significant impact on New Zealanders. So this is now in 2018, we've all moved into the purple arrow. So all hospitals near you are now having excellent thrombolysis services, in part due to some of my colleagues who are here in the audience. We're also the best region in the country. It's okay to gloat occasionally a little bit, um, but people are certainly coming up. Um, and the really good news in 2021, almost all of New Zealand is now covered by some kind of telestroke service. A lot of it is still with telephone, but slowly people are coming around to using video conferencing. Telestroke has moved on, so we've recently completed a cluster randomized community trial looking of telestroke in the ambulance. So the idea here is that if we move the telestroke consultant not just into another ED, but into the ambulance before ED. We can assess the patient, we can do everything, we save time, we can go straight to CT and um, thrombolize in CT because time is brain. But it also allows us to do really quick decision making in the ambulance to potentially divert patients. Because I talked about that clot retrieval thing earlier that's only available in three centers in New Zealand. If we can very accurately determine whether a patient is a clot retrieval candidate early, we can divert them past the smaller centers and get them there quickly. Um, and we compared that to a variety of ambulance scores and unsurprisingly, if you have a consultant neurologist in the ambulance with you, um, you have a much higher accuracy. Now, I've done, we've done some other work around uh, reversal agents for uh, anticoagulants pre-stroke and this was the largest case series in the world and it really was practice changing across the globe. I'm just highlighting a few things, saying that I'm not just doing New Zealand research, but it is the focus of today. Um, and we've been real um, uh, uh, at the forefront of tenecteplase. It's been endorsed by guidelines, but it's been slow uptake around the world. And we've just, uh, we're just publishing the, the largest case series of that showing clear benefit for patients. So um, there's lots more papers, work, international collaborates, you know, you go on. I don't have time to talk about it. What I want to talk about is Regents Care. So that's uh, the second part of this talk. So Regents Care is, stands for Reducing Ethnic and Geographic Inequities in New Zealand Stroke Care. And why do we do Regents Care? Regents Care because of some unanswered questions. So we really had, I felt like we got the solution for reperfusion. Maybe you don't have great telestroke services everywhere in the country, but once we do, all of that is sorted. Equity, great. Um, but was, was it the only problem in stroke care that we faced? Or is it the only one that was visible? Uh, and we do know, we've known for a long time that smaller hospitals compromise on best practice stroke care because they don't have the economy of scale to provide the same services in tertiary hospitals. And people would always say things, yes, but you know, closer to home and all makes up for it and there's really great community and transitions of care are great and that all may be true, but we didn't actually know. We didn't know if these compromises actually affected patients' outcome. We also knew that Maori and Pacific patients experience stroke at a younger age, um, but do they have worse outcomes? We did not know that. Uh, we have had some conflicting data on that in New Zealand, and not very much data. And if outcomes are different, is it attributable to differences in risk factors and stroke types, which is what had been commonly assumed, 
or do we need to actually be a little bit concerned about the possibility of unconscious bias and institutional racism within our hospital stroke services? That question had never been answered. And is there something intrinsically different about patients of different ethnic groups and perhaps even those presenting to non-urban hospitals that could explain any of this? So these were some of the questions. So this is a prospective New Zealand-wide observational study, 2,400 patients, all stroke hospitals in New Zealand. So we achieved census data, which is pretty unique internationally with 12 months follow-up, adjusted for ethnicity, virality, age, stroke severity, stroke type, any kind of risk factor and baseline um, independence we could think of. We had a really rich data set, which nobody can tell you better about than my PhD student, Steph Thompson, who's wrangled this data for two or three years now and is about to go crazy about it. <laughs> but it's, um, she's done an amazing job. Um, so let me talk about stroke types and risk factors. Firstly, comparing urban and non-urban, and that is really small, so I don't know if you can see it, so you'll have to take my word for it. Um, so looking at the non-urban group, so the question is, is there something different about patients presenting to non-urban hospitals that could potentially explain any differences in outcome? And um, the first thing we notice is ethnicity is different in non-urban places. They're more Maori, they're more fewer Pacific, and fewer Asians. Not really that surprising, um, but it's good to have that data. Now we see some differences. There are fewer, more strokes unspecified. There are more unknown ischemic cause, and there's a slightly different proportions of different causes of hemorrhages. Now, I'll start with hemorrhages. Hemorrhage are really difficult to diagnose, whether it's a low bar hemorrhage or a deep hemorrhage, and it requires some significant expertise. Whether, but if, if a diagnosis is unknown, it usually means that people haven't either looked hard enough or they're not quite sure how to make the diagnosis. And if a patient has um, an unspecified stroke, it suggests that the coding team isn't quite clear about what they're doing. And these are things that happen when you don't have expert specialist services. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not a reflecting reflection of the patients, it's a reflection of the hospitals taking care of those patients. But there are some differences in risk factors. Patients presenting to non-urban hospitals have more TIAs before they have their stroke. Why might that be? It may just be coincidence, but maybe they had their TIA and they had delayed intervention for their TIA to prevent the stroke. This is postulation. Um, there are more, there's more dyslipidemia and more smoking. So there are a couple risk factors that are different, but mostly not that different. Things are a little bit different when you look at ethnicity. The most striking thing is that the age of the st uh, people have a stroke at is much younger in Maori, Pacific, and Asian, by, especially Maori and Pacific, by about um, 10, 12 years. This is something we've known, so we've reestablished that. Asians and Pacific have more hemorrhages. Asian and Pacifics also have more small vessel disease. And those of you who are my students who've seen me give this lecture know that it's the same causes for both diseases in most cases because most, small, most hemorrhages are due to hypertension and that's the biggest risk factor for small vessel disease. And if you look at risk factors, voila, hypertension and, and diabetes, the two biggest risk factors for both disease processes, really common in these, um, in these patient groups. Um, Maori, on, by contrast, have more cardioembolic disease with atrial fibrillation. You see more atrial fibrillation due to higher rates of rheumatic heart disease. Outcomes. So that's baseline characteristics. Are there different outcomes? So this, I'll explain what this means. 12 months modified Rankin score is a disability score. If you score zero, you have no symptoms. If you score six, you're dead. And everything else falls between. So this is a, a ordinal analysis considering each of these endpoints and comparing groups. And so I've just put some, some um, boxes around. Basically, if you have more death, that's bad. And if you have more one, two, or three, that's good. And if you look at the urban group, there's more one, uh, zero, one, two, sorry, zero, one, two, and less death. And you can then calculate that into an adjusted odds ratio because we wanted to adjust the results by risk factors. In the urban analysis, we adjusted for ethnicity, we adjusted for stroke severity, so age, all of that's been adjusted for. So what this means, an adjusted odds ratio of 0 0.76, means that if you present to a non-urban hospital, you're three quarters as likely to have a good outcome after your stroke compared to when you present to an urban hospital. When you look at ethnicity, we've grouped New Zealand and non New Zealand European and non-European. And here you have your 
just over half as likely to have a favorable outcome compared to New Zealand Europeans. So those are pretty, so turning it around, if you're, if you're European, you're twice as likely to have a good outcome. That's basically what that means. Now we did another analysis, and I just want to credit Maureen Corbin and Haley Dennison, you can barely see that down there, who did the analysis uh, from Massey University, linking with the IDI big data, and we had a larger sample size to drill down on the ethnic subgroups. And it was really striking, and we saw similar patterns in our region's care data, was that the inequity in outcomes was driven primarily by Maori. And this is adjusted for socioeconomic deprivation as well, which we couldn't do in our um, 2,400 people, but we could do linking with the IDI data. And so you're, you're, this is a bit reversed, but if you're Maori, you're 1.3 times as likely to have an unfavorable outcome at 3, 6, and 12 months after your stroke. Okay, so let's look at what interventions people access by geography. So let me explain this to you here. So this is um, at odds ratios. If you are one, it means it's the same to co the comparator. The comparator here is urban hospital. And if you're on this side, it means you have it less. If you're on this side, you have it more. And if you cross one, it's not significant. So these bars are the ones that are significantly worse. And so we have worse access to thrombectomy if you're in a non-urban hospital, worse access to acute stroke care, and worse access to antiplatelets given early, worse access to, to DVT prophylaxis. But equal access to thrombolysis, yay, telestroke. So we have achieved something, but we have a bit of a ways to go. We also have worse ac um, um, access to intensive therapy, um, rehabilitation and community services, and we have less access to specialists. But there are some good things um, that happen to, for people when they present to non-urban hospitals, and specifically, better Maori tikanga support offered to Maori patients in Fana. And I'm thinking here the Gisbins and the Wanganui's who really put a lot of effort into this and we can learn from those. And better access to GPs and um, clinical nurse specialists. What about ethnicity? You can already see a little bit less red. So the ethnicity differences fortunately weren't as bad as the geography differences. But we did have worse um, acute stroke unit access and worse swallowing assessment, but there were some good news stories as well. Especially for Pacific, we saw better education following the stroke, better education around exercise and diet and stroke recurrence. We didn't see it as strongly for Maori. So there's a little bit of work to do, and perhaps it's because Pacific patients live in urban centers that may be a little bit more resourced. But of course, it was all controlled for rurality, so it's hard to draw those conclusions, but that's possible. But um, a little bit, so it's a good, so it's, there's a, people are going out of their way to support some high-risk populations better. And I think that's a really good, good um, thing to emphasize. And everyone in the non-New Zealand group had better access to GP following up. So this is also really great. We're, we're doing something. We ran some focus groups. This was, I just want to recognize Mate de Howard, who did most of that work. A wonderful person. Um, I'm very fortunate to work with her, and she um, did somatic analysis. Steph also did some surveys, and was really striking to us that actually by ethnicity the responses weren't that different. That the human experience seemed relatively similar for people, and um, everyone was worried about geographic inequities. Hardly anyone uh, raised any concerns about ethnic inequities. Actually, the health workers who raised concerns about that more so than the patients. Communication was a real big point, and I have some quotes here for you. I won't read this one, but I will read this one because I know there's a lot of clinicians in the audience. And this patient said, I feel that some of the people kind of think they're far above you. Some people came into the room and they would have their own conversation with other people about you, in front of you, using terminology that I didn't understand and stuff like that. And then they'd go, you all right? And then they'd leave. I've done that. Who hasn't done that here? You know, we get into our teaching round, we talk, we, we, we kind of think we're talking to the students and the patient at the same time. We think that's sort of efficient, but it's clearly not working very well. So I think we need to take that to heart. So communication is important. It's great when it works well. It's really lousy when it doesn't. Um, everyone seemed to kind of agree in general. The in-hospital experience was actually pretty good. Uh, patients were very complimentary of our care, but once they are discharged, we sort of dropped them and there was no follow-up, and that was a really big concern, and there's hidden costs. 
So in conclusion, regions care. What did it tell us? So there's clear differences in outcomes by geography. And it cannot be explained by differences in risk factors. The, re the regional differences were minimal. And the ethnic differences were there, but we did control for all of them in the analysis. Geographic access barriers to best practice care are probably the explanation. Now, we didn't test for causation, but it's a pretty strong correlation. So what can we do? We can strengthen our networks. We can maybe think about centralization. So we have this idea that we don't transfer people to tertiary hospitals, and sometimes we think people want to stay closer to home, and some people do. We asked patients, we ran a survey, 20% wanted at all costs to stay closer to home, 80% really wanted to be given the option. So let's think about that. Staff education, greater expert staffing, or maybe more remote support, maybe telehealth in other areas than just the hyperacute stroke. Um, and we can improve, we really need to improve access to stroke clot retrieval. That was the worst inequity and we knew that. I'm really pleased that in part um, fostered by these results, the Ministry of Health finally come through and supported the National Stroke Clot Retrieval Service Improvement Program, which some of you here are involved. It's looking to be one of the first national services um, to really reduce the equity. And I'm le co-leading that with Stefan Brew, interventionist from Auckland. Um, but we also need to do more um, in the post-recovery state when patients go into the community. And I want to highlight um, uh, Harry McNaughton and Vivian Fu have done this fantastic work around take charge after stroke. And there's really no reason why we shouldn't just be implementing that everywhere. Uh, it's a cheap intervention for community. It empowers patients to set their own goals. And um, it's sort of a psychological counseling. So we need to do more like that, more, more things like that. Um, and also, I'm really pleased we've just gotten another contract through from the ministry, again, part because of this study, because when Steph called those 2,500 patients, um, they really liked it. And they said, you're the first person who's called us after discharge. And that may not be the case for Wellington Hospital, but it's the case for some other hospitals. And so we said, well, we want to develop the register, and we want to do mandatory three-month modified ranking score to measure outcomes. And guess what? We get to call the patient to see how they're going, and they'll like it. And they did. And so it's sort of um, it's a research thing, but we're actually providing some service to the community. Now, but what about ethnic differences? Differences in risk factors seem to be driving differences in stroke types. But neither can fully explain differences in outcome, especially for Maori, because we did control for this. Um, there seems to be less service inequality by ethnicity than geography, which is reassuring. But there is some. Efforts to increase equity more um, visible for Pacific than Maori. So it's great that we see that effort in the Pacifica community, but we see, need to see a little bit more in the Maori community. And maybe there is still a rural factor. I mean, we still have relatively under-resourced hospitals in small town uh, New Zealand, and Maori gets sort of the double hit, you know, Maori and being mostly in small towns. So I think that still needs to be explored a little bit, but I don't think it's the only answer. And the reason why I say that is because globally, if you look at the stroke literature, it's quite interesting. So the worst outcomes in North America are for indigenous Native Americans, then African Americans, then Hispanics. So there seems to be something um, especially affecting the indigenous people that have been around the longest. And um, is that genetic? I don't know. That's not my area of expertise. But my feeling is there probably isn't that much that Maori and indigenous Native Americans have in common genetically, more so than all the other people who live in between. Some food for thought. So the new health reform is a great start, but I think we all here can contribute as well. We may not be part of that, that the Maori Health Authority effort, but what can we do? First of all, we can acknowledge inequities, and we can um, acknowledge that they are intrinsically unfair. And we can reflect on our own biases because they probably are there. Uh, we can improve cultural competence. And if you don't know where to start, do some Tetriti training. I've done two or three of those. I learn something every time. We can be familiar with cultural support services. When, when's the last time you visited your Maori health provider at CCDHB? Think about that. Maybe make some connections. So do different folks have different strokes? Well, at population level, there are differences in proportion of stroke types, and that seems to be driven by risk factors. But a stroke is a stroke, and suffering after stroke is universal, and there was a very shared human experience in the focus groups that we encountered. 
And really, I believe everyone should be offered the best practice care so we achieve equality. And we probably need to individualize care for every patient, depending on their age, their culture, their personality. And then we do need to pay that extra special attention to high-risk groups to actually achieve equity. And if we do that, then we'll achieve, I will have achieved great stroke care for all. In the last few minutes, I'll just run through some reflections. So this is this thing, we're celebrating my success. You know, you do these lectures, you think about this way too much. Um, so um, what do I, you know, I'm thinking about it like, who do I thank? Well, actually, I think I've been really lucky, is the first thing. I've been incredibly privileged. I come from a wealthy family. My father is a doctor. Now, they weren't wealthy when they started. They've went through all sorts of crazy things, um, uh, uh, difficult things to, to achieve where they've gotten there to. But I had no difficulties, never had any real financial problems. Um, so I've been lucky. I've been imparted in, in, in with great core values as a young person. And I'm gifted a sort of limitless imagination of what might be possible. And I have a whimsical way to go about my life. I pick up opportunities and I'll just carry on. If I fall down, I say, oh, well, let's try it again. And maybe that makes me a little bit different. But I think mostly, mostly what has been the foundation of my success is my teams. And I actually believe I've achieved nothing. I believe I've just been lucky to be on teams who've achieved everything. So I want to thank some teams. The first team I want to thank is Team Ranta. Uh, this is at our naturalization, where actually Peter did um, the blessing. So uh, that was lovely to have you here today. And so um, firstly, I have to say about John. So John is the most wonderful man I've ever met. And um, I'm not exaggerating. He's been there for me all throughout. What I'm doing today would absolutely not have been possible. Uh, I would not be an academic clinician, which is hard anyway but to have a parent at home who's watched the kids and has given up his career for me that is so incredible that I can never thank him enough. And he's, despite that, uh, flourished afterwards and has done all these amazing things. He's uh, run as an MP in Ohio, so he's a very successful person, but he's put all of that on hold. So thank you very much. You're my rock, and I love you so much. And I conferred with your eldest whether flowers would be appropriate. This is what you do when you're a man. You give flowers to your wife. And I said, I don't know. And Sarah said, you're so sexist. Men like beautiful things. So here we go. Now, there are two other people in the picture. And in my family, uh, yes, we have parents and we have children, but I really think first we're a team. And Sarah and Daphne have been there in the way John has. They started putting themselves to bed when they were like eight. I don't have no idea when they go to bed. I'm probably really terrible. But we, we practice this benevolent neglect philosophy in my household. Um, we, we, uh, they, they make their own lunches. And one day they came to me and said, Mom, you look really stressed. Is there something we can do to help? And I said, oh, this is like when they're like eight or ten. It's like, could you make your own lunches? It's like, yeah, we can make our own lunches. They regret that now that they said that. But um, so they've been making their own lunches. Sierra cleans the house, and Daphne cooks dinner once a week. And they're just absolutely, and they give me hugs when I'm sad. And I have flowers for you. <laughs> Sorry. Now, there are lots of other teams, and I know that there are some people across the, across the grand seas. Uh, the rest of my fauna, none of you have ever met any of these people. I do have other fauna. They're just not in New Zealand. Uh, we meet over Zoom now because I haven't seen them in years, seems like. Um, so hello, Whitmans, and hello, Vooks. Uh, thank you for your support. Uh, team, team Palmerston North, I really loved you, loved working there, and um, I miss you. I want to shout out to the Team Kariga, which is our New Zealand fauna. Um, the Department of Neurology in Wellington has been so welcoming and so supportive, and of course, we would have never gotten Telestroke off the ground without you. Um, the Department of Medicine is a very special group of people that I've enjoyed working with much, so much over the last few years. And Stroke Team um, uh, Wellington, uh, Stroke Team Central, 
the Regents Care team, which is uh, a really big team, wonderful people, and of course, I cannot put all my research team on here. But I also want to put a special thanks for our whanau at Kokori Marae, who've helped me tremendously on my cultural journey. Um, kia ora. Thank you. Um, and I just want to highlight a couple people here, which is really blurry. Um, John Gommens has been a really great mentor and supporter for me for the years. And Alan Barber and John Fink have been sort of my stroke uh, counterparts in Auckland and in Wellington. And, um, you know, it's been great fun working, working with you guys if you're listening in. So thank you for your support. And you've been uh, really helpful in my career and asserting myself in various ways. Um, so uh, just a few more slides because it made me, made me t sort of what is it about teams and, and what it is about teams is you have a shared goal and when everyone has a shared goal and swims in one direction you get very powerful and with power you can affect change and you cannot do that by yourself. Um, you can also support each other, but if you bring diverse people into the group, you're even more powerful. And why is that? Because when you have a diversity in your group, it increases success due to early engagement with people who are your eventual stakeholders, and they're already part of the team. But it also gives all sorts of great ideas that makes the product, whatever you're working on, better from the start. Um, but it does require kindness and openness, and there are cultural differences, and they can create challenges. And I have been on a really long cultural journey. I've spent six, an average 16 years uh, times three in three continents. So I've really lived culture. I haven't been there for a year or two or three. I have really been part of three cultures now. And I've appreciated the importance of language. Um, it can help, but it can also create barriers. And different cultures have different core values and different priorities. And that's OK. And it makes it more fun and it makes it more rich but it can lead to often completely inadvertent conflict because we just don't know how to communicate with one another well. So we need to train ourselves. Uh, different cultures also hold different power in our society, and some feel and are marginalized and disadvantaged as a result. I've reflected, I've talked all this about ethnicity, and I've reflected on Maori health advancement and reconciling the burden of being a colonizer. And I've been thinking about lessons I've learned from being German. And when you grow up in Germany, you, you live with this cultural identity that your people have killed six million Jews. And people always say, oh, you know, but you weren't there. You know, you shouldn't feel guilty about that. And when I talk to people about colonization, um, you know, just in passing, it's not like a big thing of mine, but, you know, you do treaty training and we talk about colonization. I hear people say that. Yeah, but I wasn't even there. I've only moved to New Zealand 10 years ago. Of course you weren't there. Who here is 150 years old? None of us were there. Even if your ancestors were there, you, then, you know, wh why would you be guilty of that? But I don't think it's guilt, and I don't think the German experience is a German guilt. And I'm not feeling guilty. I actually feel empowered because I've been taught at a young age that I carry a responsibility, a responsibility to be aware, to acknowledge, to not brush it under the carpet. Yes, we killed six million Jews, and it's horrid, and it's horrible. I cannot tell you how many pictures I've seen of concentration camps. It is hard to do that when you're in year 10. I didn't even know there was a Pacific theater to World War II because it was all about that. But I appreciate that I have been taught that because I know what people can do, good people, my grandparents. I know what people can do. And it's not about feeling guilty about what happened in the past. It's acknowledging that we are the inheritors of the, our past and we benefit from these things. I benefit from Jews being kicked out of their homes because the German people had more real estate. I benefit from that. So I'm not going to feel guilty, but I will feel guilty if I get to the end of my life and I haven't done anything to improve the present. So that's my interpretation of things. And, but having, you know, further, you know, it's, it's, it's really clear doing this work, it's not my battle. I'm not Maori, I'm not Jewish, I'm, I cannot lead this work. I can support the work, I can contribute to the work, and I can um, be there if I'm wanted. But I don't get to be the hero of this tale, and most of us don't get the hero of this tale. 
to be this, of this tale. But we need to empower those who should be the heroes of this tale. And we can create space. We can create the dialogue. We can shut up sometimes and let Maori people talk and take the reins of their own um, destiny. And we can do things like treaty training, cultural training, learning te reo, showing respect. And that's the kind of journey I'm taking at the moment, I'm hoping, during my sabbatical. But it also made me think about, well, who are my people? You know, I cannot speak for all these people I feel, you know, had all these injustices. What about me? So it made me think about who am I? And it forced me to reflect on being a woman academic. And last year, uh, I was called out at a lecture saying, I'm not a feminist because I was showing some female books and I was worried I would be, you know, sort of nicheified as a feminist. And, and I said, well, why am I so ashamed of saying the word feminist? It's not something that rolls off my tongue. It's not, that's not been what I've been doing as in, in my, during my career. And I'd grown, I'd, I'd sort of grown afraid. So when I was a child, I never thought of myself as a girl or a woman. I just thought of myself as me. And then I go to chemistry class and the teacher says, why are you worried about your grade? It's chemistry, you're just a girl. Um, or a friend of my dad's tells me when I think about medical school, why would you go to medical school? You're pretty enough to get a husband. And I have interviews where I'm not hired because I'm a woman and sort of it escalates. And um, I'm sorry to say, I've actually been um, sexually assaulted on multiple occasions and you feel small and you feel weak and you feel vulnerable. And what do you do in that situation? What you should do, should have listened to my grandfather and be courageous and speak up and I should have spoken up. But what did I do? I was afraid. I was worried that my career would be hampered by being a woman. And I wanted to help people. So I became assimilated to the male medical culture. And I became more of a man. I became assertive, competitive, and I bought into all of those things. And they're not all bad, but they weren't really me. And uh, that's been a really interesting awakening for me, going through this process. And it's brought me to this through my health journey with, uh, the, uh, around Maori equity. And so I thank you for that, to kind of acknowledge my own challenges and my own trauma. Not big trauma by comparison, but um, just sort of working through that, who am I? And, you know, it's sort of, you know, we define people by not aligning with the status quo. We say, oh, that woman, oh, that brown person, or that gay person, or that disabled person, we, we, that's, who be, that's who these people become because they're not the status quo. And it results in either assimilation, wanting to be like the status quo, changing yourself to fit in, or chronic underachievement through silent resignation. And we all lose because we lose those diverse voices on our teams. So different sources of strength. So I think womanhood, I have decided womanhood is a culture. Um, and I think some of us are part of that culture and we can embrace that culture. And I think womanhood is marked by collaboration and emphasis on the collective, celebration of family, motherhood. Why hide it? Why do we hide? We have to hide, you know, my friend in America cannot take, sort of go off, I have to take care of my kids because that wouldn't look good in her department because, oh, it's the woman going off again. So these things still happen. We value humility, forgiveness, and being soft. Why do we always have to be hard? These are one of my favorite quotes from the Tao Te Ching, the hard and stiff will be broken, the soft and supple will prevail. Question traditional measures of success. How do we measure that we have succeeded? I like publishing in the New Zealand Medical Journal because it's my people reading the article, but it doesn't have a high impact factor and it doesn't get cited. So I'm on this national group called the Global Burden of Disease Group with 500 author, 1,000 citations, brought up my H index and helped me promote. I'm not proud of that work. I changed the comma here or there. That's what we have to do. Those are the, jump, the hoops we have to jump through. And how's that impact? How's that helping anybody, really? Um, and then, why don't women get promoted? Maybe the HODs didn't support them, but maybe they don't really care. Maybe women, I mean, some do, and I'm not going to minimize that, but you know, if you have to do these things to get promoted, at some point you say, well, this is just silly. I just want to have impact. I just want to help my community. Um, individual prizes feel icky. Certainly to me, I always get really uncomfortable. Team prizes are fine, but why have prizes at all? Why don't we celebrate everybody? Female keynote speakers are really hard to get. You want that on your CV. Why is, are they hard to get? Because they have children to take care of. They cannot just travel around the world. So these are all things that impact our academic progression. And I think it's time to rethink what we value.
second to last slide, some great women. There are many, many more great women. These are the ones that happened to pop in my mind when I put the slide, and then the slide was filled. And um, these are people who are amazing, who have helped me, who've supported me, or who've inspired me. And um, so thank you for being there, and thank you for being there for me. And I thought about it, well, you know, I should have a picture of men because I'm all into equity. And then I thought, well, actually, until, until everyone, uh, well, actually, I thought about, like, you know, I think I'm the first female adult neurologist in New Zealand who's a professor. I think I'm the first female physician in the Department of Medicine who's become a professor. We're not there yet. We still have a lot of work to do. So until everyone sees me as just me and not as just that woman, I'm going to keep doing this. Together we're strong. Final slide. Let's stop trying to make everyone the same. Celebrate, understand, and use our differences to build great teams and achieve great outcomes for our people. I've shown you what multidisciplinary stroke networks can achieve by working together across hospitals, regions, the country, the world. We have seen what a united New Zealand can do to smash COVID. Well, maybe. Um, New Zealand was first to achieve women's suffrage, a modern welfare system, and we have great parental laws, and now health reforms, including Maud and Maori Health Authority. New Zealanders are brave and innovative and aiming for the right thing, equity and support for, all, for the good of all. Let's not let our differences get in the way. Keep going and do even more. Imagine if we could fully eradicate health equity and bring the rest of the world along with us. Thank you for listening, and thank you for giving me a place to call home.
been hugely affected, as you can tell, by listening to Anna. She's my head of department, although I'm standing sort of in her shoes at the moment as acting head of department. Anna, mine's a family affected by stroke. I have atrial fibrillation. I feel like I'm going to go home and have tattoo. I'm about to move to Motueka which is sort of your area. I think I'm going to have Tattoo take me to Anna Rain. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hugely impressed hearing about how the New Zealand community, Aotearoa, are impacted by your research and the research you have done with colleagues. Thank you for changing stroke care in New Zealand and Aotearoa. Anna talked a lot too about teams, and I was equally affected by that. One of the things perhaps that Anna didn't say, but I think you probably picked up, is she is an extraordinary leader. She's a leader of teams, she's a leader of people, and it's because she cares about people. And I equally want to thank you for that, Anna. You create the space where people can be who they, who they are. You're an inclusive leader. And in a very rare combination, you're also a decisive leader when you need to be. And that is truly a valuable and rare combination. It gives me great pleasure to offer a vote of thanks, I suppose this is called. Thank you for being you. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. Thank you for being who you are to your whanau, to your colleagues, to the patients you serve, 
to the community, the whanau of New Zealand, for our children. Thank you. It's interesting that I was there, and when you became a, a New Zealand citizen, um, Igmo Sagan, thank you for doing that. We are very glad to have New Zealand. Um, or they are here in New, in New Zealand, and they have not nach America or Deutschland um, zurückgeflogen. <laughs> we are very glad. And in closing, I'll say. Um, Puru tia mai te tai no te rangi ki a tīna, ki a whena, ki a toko te manua ora, tīna toko te manua ora i rongi i a koe, i ronga i a koutou tātou katoa, di 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 au pai māre de. Kia ora everyone.